If it goes right, it's a slice. If it goes left, it's a hook. If it goes straight, it's a miracle. This is Out of Bounds. If it's happening in the world of golf, we're talking about it. Coverage, debate, discussion, pro golf and local golf. Let's do it. This is Out of Bounds. And here are your hosts, Nate Sharman and Josh Derso. All right, welcome to the Out of Bounds podcast. Josh Derso and Nate Sharman here keeping you in bounds with the latest from around the golf world. Pebble Beach is over. It was wet. Uh, Nate, quite an interesting weekend uh, here in professional golf that we uh, got to live through here. Yeah, got shortened to a 54-hole event over at Pebble Beach, and then you had Live going on, too. That kind of sparked the whole golf world, right? So two 54-hole event golf tournaments, uh, the Live going into a playoff, too, with Hokeem Neiman winning over there. Uh, actually, it was longer than the PGA Tour tournament, which is pretty funny about how much we've talked about how, how short those Live tournaments are. But let's stop, or let's go back to the PGA event. Wyndham Clark gets his third victory. He has now won, Josh, two elevated events in a major in the span of, what, a year? What, a calendar year, right? So pretty impressive stuff for Wyndham Clark. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, to see him having haven't done that so yeah didn't do the fourth round because of weather just absolute crazy scenes in california right now uh with some of the wind and rain area coming through um but yeah josh he shoots 60 on 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 saturday flies himself into the top ties the course record at pebble beach um they were, we're playing lift clean and pl- lift clean in place right josh it's, it's a term that we use sometimes we call lift clean and cheat right so you know players are playing preferred lies in their own fairways um, it's a good thing because, you know, mud does impact the, the the path of the golf ball for a lot of these players, especially at their level, Josh. But what do you think goes into talking about Wyndham Clark having, the, you know, tying the course record um, on a day where you lift clean and placed? I mean, first of all, incredible performance. To shoot a 60 under any circumstances is very impressive. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of people who, you know, don't really look at it the same way. <laughs> Excuse me. Don't really look at it the same way as – a 60 under normal circumstances because of just how wet it was like forget the lift clean in place you know just it, the course is more receptive it's going to be easier to score under those circumstances especially for those guys um but you know what like i don't think i have as much of a problem with the 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 rule and still being able like the ruling of making it lift clean in place on a day and then having a guy go out and shoot the course record you still got to call it the course record because everybody had the chance to to shoot that number right like right. yeah. every, everybody went out that day and had the chance to do it. Um, my question for you has more to do with um, the effect, I guess, kind of like how unceremonious the entire uh, weekend becomes when you have a, a rained out event. And one of the things that was mentioned quite a bit afterwards on social media, and I think I even uh, caught a couple of clips off Golf Channel where they were talking about, you know, maybe it's time this event be moved into the summer when weather won't be as much of a factor. Um, obviously, winter typically not. You know, you're typically not getting tropical type of rain out in Southern California um, this time of year. But uh, winter, you never know what the weather's going to be like anywhere in the U.S. with global warming. So, um, question B: Would you like to see this since it is such a a significant event for the tour? Uh, moved into maybe like a late May, early June, or maybe even July? I don't know. That's hard because it would just be so hot. It would be, you know, it would be really, really warm. And, and that's kind of the time where they play more so on the East Coast and, and you know, in, in, uh, in the Midwest a little bit too is in those months. So it's hard to kind of find an open weekend, right? Especially because the fact that they play in Hawaii the week, a couple weeks before and they, you know, kind of make that progression across the United States with how the weather moves around, Josh. But yeah, there really wasn't an option for the tour. You know, they tried to think about playing Monday and they had that idea. They were coming home on that. And then just the weather just wasn't really let them be able to do that. So I think it was ultimately a good decision. You know, players kind of, you, you got to move on the tournament to the, the Waste Management Phoenix Open. That's coming up this week in, in, in Arizona. So uh, yeah, definitely an unfortunate situation, Josh. You, you think they should move it to the summer? I, I think the tour should be, should start to think more strategically about a bunch of these events. Um, the timing, you know, I, I think there's opportunities throughout the schedule to, to move some of these higher profile events to better times where, you know, it seems like we talk about this three or four times a year when there's an event where we're, we're kind of scratching our heads saying, why is this event happening now? Um, you know, I think about, uh, I think about the RBC down in, in Hilton Head the week after a major, 
A lot of people, you know, scratch their head about that because that's it's a hallmark event for the tour, and yet it's it's held at this point in the schedule where you know players are really struggling to you know keep it going and and play. Um, but yeah, I you know I, I'm not even sure is this going to be an elevated event after this year, or is this one of the events that's getting pulled back? Um, I believe it's still. Um... I mean, we talk about that too. It was a little lot different watching this event elevated, you know, just a lot less players and, you know, they used a, a less course, but Josh, I'm not sure what the future holds um, for the elevated events in general too, right? You know, so much changing with, with some of these, you know, deals that they've made with the strategic sports group and, you know, possibly the PIF. So, so things could change at the drop of a hat, right? And sponsors have been, I think we're going to kind of see a cascading of, of sponsors coming and going over the next few seasons. So I think year to year, this is going to be something that we see changing. Um, and you just hope that events like this continue to be uh, as attractive as they uh, always were. Obviously, Waste Management Open, we're going to talk about that one a little while. That one's not going to be an elevated event, and that's often been referred to as, as Golf Super Bowl. So, you know, it's one of those scenarios where um, these things don't always make a lot of sense. But uh, let's shift gears here and talk a little bit about Live. Um, many would say that this past weekend was the best week for live golf since it started. Uh, you had a playoff between Neiman and Garcia, uh, John Rahm chasing Brooks Kepka in the mix, Cam Smith in the mix, um, played through the dark, uh, obviously having, uh, no real sports on TV to compete with. Um, and then naturally not having, uh, the PGA tour to compete with helped, uh, live, I guess, on its way to having its, quote, best weekend uh, ever. But I also, you know, one of the things that stood out to me is a lot of people saying, pointing to, you know, Pebble Beach being rained out um, or there not being any football on to compete with uh, as the reason for this being the, the best weekend yet for live. And honestly, I, I think two things stand out to me. One, um, the broadcast has greatly improved from past uh, the past two years. Uh, the second is uh, this was the the first event really that we saw John Rahm on live, and I yeah. think it makes a difference. Yeah, definitely. It's it, it definitely paved the way throughout the day, right? When when the bad or when the uh, PJ Tour event kept getting moved, and then we had the Pro Bowl, which if you're an NFL fan, you know the Pro Bowl isn't that important, but um, it really kind of paved the way for them, and I, I think Liv did a really nice job of kind of grasping that opportunity right and being successful josh and i think you hit the nail on the head there with you know being able to show their product and you know people being able to go on their tv the cw and say oh what's maybe maybe they don't know a lot about live right i think a lot of a lot of people don't really know a lot and they kind of tune in and, and watch for a little while and say oh, this is kind of exciting right especially when you know you see john rom on a sunday on a leaderboard fist pumping and, and hitting the uh, hitting the uh, live mic too as well you know kind of doing john rom antics is, is a lot of fun to watch too and you had some other about other you know relatively big names like hokey or like hokey neiman of course that won sergio garcia has been around forever and, and a major champion so i think that's really fun to watch too in that aspect josh i don't know if i like the broadcast as much as you i think it has spots to be improved and that starts with the leaderboard for me I don't like the leaderboard. It, you know, it takes up 20, 20 ish percent of the screen, right? And it's always moving and flashing and changing, which you don't necessarily need because I don't know. I don't know if I need to like see real life, real time standings in terms of golf, right? You know, golf takes a little while to progress, so it's not like it needs to be updated the second that a player, you know, makes makes a putt or something like that. So I don't know what that can be changed. It kind of feels like you're watching a NASCAR race where guys are bumping back up and forth, right? And then you have the whole team leaderboard at the bottom left, which I don't know if I'm completely sold on the whole team aspect of team golf yet. I think it's it's definitely growing on me and becoming a lot more interesting to watch. But um, yeah, the leaderboard, I, I, I think they need to figure out a way where we can make that less distracting to the viewer. Um, when I'm watching golf shots, which I'll, I'll get to too, I think I've kind of sometimes peer my eye over the leaderboard a little bit and it's easy to get distracted by that. But at the end of the day, Josh, they do a really good job of showing golf. <laughs> This is something the PGA Tour has failed over the last few years is showing enough golf shots. We had a guy like Colin Morikawa complain about this a couple weeks ago. Before his tee time, he was watching the golf watching the golf channel, and he saw, I think he said, six golf shots in an hour or something like that. Liv does a really good job of not keying in too much on a certain person in the booth or something like that, but just showing golf shots. And, and that's, 
at the end of the day, that's what the viewer wants to see. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that stands out to me is just how much more fast paced watching live golf feels yes, it is. than watching the PGA Tour. Um, you know, I, I would agree on the scoreboard, although I do like I, I do like that it's always there and that you don't have to wait. Um, and I really strongly dislike the scoreboard that we see on CBS and NBC um, with PGA Tour events with that little box in the lower right-hand corner. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's it's hard to read. It's hard to see. Um, you know, and I, I don't necessarily really love the scroller at the bottom either. The team thing, I, I think... You know, the team format is something that's going to take years to really grow um, for for people to buy in on teams that, you know, franchises, they're literally calling them franchises, that haven't existed for more than a couple of years. I mean, it's just, you know, you're not going to get that overnight. But um, right. I, I agree. I think there's an opportunity with um, with the team aspect of things. In the short term, I, I think the big draw for Liv is – having quality leaderboards like having quality player star filled leaderboards you know i i was thinking about this this past uh, sunday you know even if pebble beach was was uh, on on sunday i genuinely wondered how many people would have been watching compared to um live because of the the names that were atop the leaderboard atop both of those leaderboards um i think now more than in past years, Live is starting to at least live on equal footing with the PGA Tour in terms of star power that very casual golf fans. I mean, like people who the average person who watches golf on TV um, would recognize. And that is probably if I'm the PGA Tour that's my biggest motivating factor to uh, improve my television product because you're going to have to work so much harder this year um, and definitely next year if, if the two sides aren't, aren't really working together um, to get viewers on your television, your broadcast product. It's not, gonna, it's, not just gonna, it's not just going to be like it has been in the past. The only thing I think is, is really going to help for the PGA Tour is they're able to kind of homegrown their stars versus, you know, the stars were, have been growing on the PGA Tour and then they get to the Live Tour. But a guy like Ludwig Eber, Eber isn't going to really build on Live. You know, this really cool story where he comes out of college and lights the world on fire, plays well in the Ryder Cup, and now he's played well this season. Or a guy like Dick Dunlap, who wins last week as an amateur, first time on tour, that's happened in 30 years. He didn't play too well last year, last week, but... On the other hand, though, with Liv, you might get some of that with a guy like Caleb Surratt, the 19-year-old who's playing on Rom's team, who uh, got a piece of that um, that group title when uh, Rom's team was able to win their first event, which which was a cool storyline in itself, right, With from the uh, team play. But, yeah, I, I don't know if you get as many storylines on Liv, but, Josh, you know, just talking about it and thinking about it a little bit more, maybe people don't need that. I don't know what people are – I don't know so much if people are looking for that. I think I do as a golf fan. I love to see the rise of a guy like Ludwig Bear and a guy like Nick Dunlap. That's, that story last week was so cool. You know, I am one of the largest Bills fans that I know, I think, and I, and I had myself kind of keying into the PGA Tour while the Bills were playing in, in an AFC Divisional game, which was, which was pretty interesting to me. But seeing Nick Dunlap go through that was really cool, and, and, and watching the rise of Ludwig Bear is pretty awesome to me. So I'm a guy that loves storylines, I think. So I think you don't get as much of that on the live tour. I kind of have trouble finding who to root for when I'm watching live, especially on Sunday when you have that jammed leaderboard. But that's just me. I think for the for the majority of golf fans, I think like what you said, Josh, you just want to see those names you recognize on the leaderboard and, and live's doing a good job of that. Well, so and I would say that's the same when a, a relative unknown or non household name wins on the PGA tour or is contending on the PGA tour, the average golf fan who, who doesn't know these guys backstories, which those of us who are Twitter feeds or our X feeds are loaded with, with golf stories every day, who's playing where and, and who the up and comers are from, from, you know, college into the pros. Like we know these things, we see these things, we're exposed to them every day, but we're like, I think of ourselves as basically representing the like 1% of golf fans. Right. That definitely, is not definitely. the majority. So like, you know, a good example would be, you know, 
yes, Ludwig is an incredible golfer. He has an incredible story. But when he's in contention at one of the first majors this year, which I'm sure is going to end up happening, a large majority of people who are watching are going to have no idea who he is. They're going to be like, who is this guy? And I think maybe people watched the Ryder Cup and he was so good in that, but yeah. I, yeah, I mean, but even the Ryder Cup to some extent is kind of this like, it's not an exhibition, but to casual golf fans, again, like I don't know that it like creates enough of an imprint on their brain to necessarily be like, oh yeah, I remember that guy from nine months ago. So I, I just think like that's the challenge. That's true. The other thing too is, and you know, you know, you and I have kind of had this conversation on a rolling basis now. I don't get the, the legacy argument anymore. Like I understand that the PGA Tour and its tournaments have been around for decades, but when you have these events being depleted by 50%, um, of the top 20 names in golf right now, top 20 players in, in golf right now, especially when they're defending major champions, what legacy, like, what is your legacy, right? Like, I I struggle with that one because things are always, we're always like, you know, prisoners of the moment here when we're talking about sports-related anything. But when I'm thinking about those casual fans, um, and I'm thinking about the, the average person who's watching golf on a Saturday or Sunday. I, I just, I don't think that some of the things that those of us who over consume professional golf matter really at all to the quote unquote average consumer. Yeah, Josh, I think what, what I think about with the legacy factor is that I just don't know who to root for when I'm watching the live tournament. You know, on Sunday when you had Rom and Garcia and Hoki Neiman going at it to, to mention another guy's like, I think on about the he poked his head out for a little while. I just don't yeah. really know who to kind of pull for in the back of my head. I think when I'm watching a PGA tour um, guy, you know, I mentioned, I love storylines so much. So, you know, watching PGA tour and you, you see like, like last week, you see Nick Dunlap play amazing on Friday and Saturday, you immediately start rooting for that guy. Right. So I think that's where I kind of come from, from that, from that uh, live versus PGA tour, that legacy kind of debate, as you're not really sure who to root for um, when they're rising up that live leaderboard on Sunday or even a Saturday for that matter. So I think two things come to mind when you say that um, people are always going to know, you know, Brooks Kepka fans are going to root for Brooks Kepka if he's on the leaderboard. Yeah, for sure. Same goes for Cam Smith. Same goes for John Rahm. You've got your name. So like, I don't think that part of it is as much of a challenge. I think the the other part that you're talking about with kind of your like unknown commodities as they rise through the ranks and they surge, um, you know, like an amateur winning an event for, you know, the, the first time in 30 years. I think those things kind of improve as Liv gets more mainstream media attention, which I think now we've turned the corner on. I think you're going to see Liv events covered in the same way that you see PGA Tour events covered. And I think that's going to solve that problem that you're describing. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right, too. Uh, what do you have to think about, you know, Hokey Neiman winning that event in the dark, right? And then the first or one of the first things he says is he mentions how he's not in any of the majors. And, and that's, you know, a problem to him. And that's probably a fundamental problem in, in golf right now. But what do you think about him saying that almost immediately after, you know, sinking that final putt in the dark to win his first little event? Yeah, look, I, I think the I think the reaction to it's kind of blown out of proportion a bit, um, but that's the deal right now. Um, I think more than before, Liv has a legitimate argument for getting its players into the majors, and uh, you know, especially given the fact that the PGA Tour wants to merge with them, work with them, um, they have world class players playing in their events every every week now or every other week when they do play, um, and you know, there's so many limited field events on the PGA tour now with these small field elevated events. I think it's harder now than before to argue that live players shouldn't be um, given some kind of access through some path to, to the majors, even if they haven't previously qualified. So, you know, I think him saying that it's important to these guys, it's important to all these guys. Like, you know, and I think this is something that really goes back to one of the uh, arguments against live throughout this entire thing has been like, well, these guys don't care. They just, they got their money and they don't care anymore. They care. These guys, like they all care. Yeah. They all, they're all competitors. They all want to win. They all want to play the best they possibly can. 
um, and they want to show their skills off on whatever stage they possibly can. So weird timing, but I feel like it's going to be a theme that we see. Um, I think you're going to see this theme play out across every live event that, that happens this year, because, uh, you know, remember how they do media over there. You kind of, I, I think a lot of the players are given talking points and right. <laughs> they basically have to uh, mention things. So, you know, it could have very well been a scenario where he was mentioning something that was near the top of the list for live to uh, it, it, that live wanted these guys talking about. I don't know. Yeah. Um, what do you What do you think? Like, what What was your reaction to it? Like when you first heard it, I had two re two immediate reactions. Where the first one, where I'm, I'm looking at this come through my ex timeline, and I'm you know I immediately thought of the meme of the I'm looking for the guy who did this. You know me, where you're you know you're kind of like okay, Hokeem, you you kind of did this to yourself. You you kind of knew the parameters going in, and then I was kind of thinking about how it's kind of a weird thing to say immediately after he wins his first live event to talk about something that doesn't really happen a live tour right they don't play the majors on the live tour so at first i was like oh live's not going to be the live powers that be aren't going to be very, very excited about this about him talking about something non-live right as he's you know on the live spotlight but then i thought about it a little bit more and this is actually a good thing for live because this drums up the conversation about how we get these best live players in the majors right so i think at the end of the day we're gonna have to find a way like you said josh um, to, to stop using over a, a OD, OWGR and, and use some different parameter to try to get these guys into the majors. Because even before, I think, maybe even before he won this live event, Yoki Neiman is a good enough golfer to play in, in the majors, right? I mean, we've seen this this guy play very well on some big stages too. So um, I think it's definitely good that this conversation happened. I think, like you said, Josh, I think it's a little bit weird how it happened. And I don't I don't know if necessarily Liv wanted that to happen that way. But you brought up a good point with that. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But, yeah, at the end of the day, OWGR needs to change and not be the parameter that gets players into majors. What do you think the biggest factor is um, when it comes to legitimacy? What do you think the biggest factor is right now that's hurting Liv golf? Like, you know, is it the 54-hole event? Is it not getting OWGR points. I mean, I feel like a lot of people have moved on from that. Is it the limited field um, events, the fact that it's basically kind of like an invitational, it's a, a organized thing rather than being anybody can just enter willy-nilly? Um, what's the What stands out to you as the biggest one? The biggest hurdle for me for Liv really in general is that it just kind of feels exhibition -y. You know, you're watching this tournament and you're seeing guys going through this and, you know, there's music just blaring in the background. So there's no way to, to kind of build tension. Uh, I think Hokey Neiman had a pretty short putt. It was like a five or six footer. And they're just blasting music in the background. And it, it just kind of just feels like a weird kind of time and place. It kind of feels like you're at your, your course's member guest, right? A little bit feel to that. Uh, you, you saw John Rahm have a couple big putts on Sunday and he had to back off a couple times because the beat dropped in the background. So I, I think that's part of it. That just kind of feels mixed exhibition-y. I think the fact that they're wearing shorts makes it even more exhibition-y. It kind of feels like you're watching a, a Sunday match, too, at your local municipality course. So I think just the fact that they're going to have to battle this exhibition feel, and that goes back to the legacy argument, too, right? Without a legacy, I, I almost – I don't know if who cares who wins is kind of the, the crazy thing to say, but it kind of feels that way sometimes, right? Without exhibition-y kind of golf live feels. But I think – that's going to change over time. You know, this, this league is only three years, three years young. So I think that's going to kind of develop, but uh, it's the exhibition golf kind of feel for me to kind of feel how I can get serious behind this. Cause it feels pretty unserious. If I had to say so myself. The music is the biggest issue. I think it, it, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like crazy. you got to find a way if you're live to get it out of the broadcast, have it on site. I, mean, I, that understand, should be easy. <laughs> I understand what they're trying to do like on site for the people who are going to these events, which honestly I think is really smart given what we're seeing. Um, you know, nobody's killing the the television ratings and we're seeing a, a move in media away from television as a, as a means of consumption anyway. So I don't really like the idea of, of doubling down on, you know, being that worried about what the, the broadcast, the TV broadcast looks like or how it sounds, but like you absolutely have to get the music out of it. Like you got to find a way to bleed that out because that is just, it's killing it. Like to your point, it almost feels like you're watching a, a circus event instead of watching something that if the music were simply gone, it would seem so much more serious. 
Yeah, definitely. And, I see what they're trying to kind of accomplish by playing music in the background, you know, just to try to be different. But I think they need, yeah, they need to find a way, like you said, Josh, to get it out of the broadcast. That should be pretty easy in theory. I mean, I get it. They're doing it for the people on site. Like the people on site want to have a good time. They're basically trying to create a party, right? Like every, every And it week. looks like a good time. I would love to go to live yeah. event. It looks like fun. So like, I, I understand why they're doing it. They just have to like figure out, and I'm not exactly sure how, how that would be accomplished, but you got to get it out of the broadcast. Um, I agree. Okay. So let's, uh, let's shift gears here and talk a little bit about what we have coming up this weekend. Uh, golf's Super Bowl. We'll call it that. Uh, we've had a couple drops. Um, Victor Hovland. Um, it, there was another one that's escaping me. Um, but we had two players, significant Xander players, Shockley. drop out. Yeah, Xander um, out this weekend. Scheffler, Thomas, Homa, Burns, Spieth, Minwoo Lee are the betting favorites now at this point. Um, full field. There's a cut. It's not elevated. Solid field. Big event. Biggest thing for me is I, I still just genuinely don't understand how this isn't an elevated event. Like it should be. Should right. be. Right. It's such a fun event. It's it's you know leads right up to the Super Bowl and you get really raucous crowds, especially on that on that stadium hole uh, on number sixteen there. It's just it's just pretty cool to see, you know, this is elevated this event is not an elevated event, right? So you still get a nine million dollar purse and you mentioned Josh, even with those dropouts of Victor Hovland and Xander Shoffley, which hurts the field of course. You still have the the number one golfer in the world, and you have the guy that won the last two years in Scotty Scheffler playing, and some of these other guys. It would be very easy to skip this event, right? A non elevated event uh, behind an event that they had to play in in terms of Pebble Beach. So that just goes to show how cool this event is. And I, I start to wonder if they think they need to make they they want to keep the big field and they want to keep the same field, and that's why they're not elevating it. You know, I'm not sure, and that's a conversation for a different day. But yeah, I, I think this event's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But at the end of the day, I, I think Scotty Scheffler just wins again. He hasn't really won since the players last year, I don't think. So I think it's kind of time for him to win. I did say that he's won this event the last two years, and it seems like he's very comfortable on this course. And as long as he can get that putter hot, I, I don't see a way where Scotty doesn't win, to be honest. So I was looking earlier at a, uh, some uh, strokes gain data, and uh, Scotty Scheffler, uh, Thomas, they are the leaders in strokes gained uh over the last JT's several years well. um at this course so you know this is you know tbc scottsdale this is this is a home run for them um yeah i i want to see jt get a win i think i want to yeah. see him win this weekend i wouldn't be surprised if him he's battling scotty and min was around too you know i i think this this has a really good chance to be a really good leader for him come on sunday and lead right into the super bowl yeah um so we'll see what uh, we'll see what comes of that. Uh, we'll be watching, of course. Um, it'll be a, an interesting. It'll be a nice precursor. This is one of the few events that uh, the PGA Tour really thinks strategically and makes sure it's out of the way by the time the Super Bowl starts. Um, so it'll be a great sports watching Sunday afternoon. Uh, and last oh, up yeah. here, we got Very a good. tweet from the USGA, or I guess a post on X. I got to stop calling them tweets. Um, we have. Most, Only known as Twitter. We have most round data for men and women. Uh, incredible. 652 rounds of golf for men and 354 for women. So what does that mean? That means one man and one woman played and logged 652 and 354 rounds of golf respectively in 2023. Is that insane? That's a lot of golf. That's what two postable 18 hole rounds a day. And that's not even factoring Josh, when you go out and play and you're just practicing, maybe you hit a couple extra seven irons, you know, to kind of dial yourself in, give yourself different lies and trying to, you know, take an extra pot, take an extra chips to try to get more feel for that golf course. It, it's just pretty amazing that he was able to log 652 rounds of golf. I mean, that's just, that's just insane. Um, I know we talk about wanting to play more golf, but that feels like a lot to 36 holes or a day almost right to, to get to that 652 number oh that's just crazy i wonder if that is or if those are individuals who are on some sort of track to or is that like a a d1 college golfer is that I don't a, know, because they're practicing a ton you you, you know yeah. they're hitting balls at the range they're not playing postable rounds twice a day that's what really kind of goes to me. You know, they're at the range beating golf balls for for a while, or, or they're hitting, you know, a seven iron out of a rough, or you know, just around the green too. So 
I don't think they even play two postal rounds a day. That's just a, 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 a crazy amount of golf. <laughs> feels like work. Like that, that many rounds yeah. of golf feels like work. So here's the question. Is it even fun? <laughs> Left to your own devices, what is the maximum number of rounds of golf, full rounds of golf, do you consider to be ideal? Um, in terms of postable rounds, I think, you know, getting one 18 you know, round in a weekend is good. So, and then you're looking at, it's hard to play an at postable round at 18 during the week. So I think, you know, once a week, maybe a little bit more every once in a while, if you have a big, you know, big holiday, I'd always say like 4th of July weekend, is a big weekend for me. I usually get more in that weekend, but so I would kind of, you know, you're looking at what 25 weeks of the year in the Northeast. Yeah. Which is pretty yeah. good. Is that a good number to put on it? So, yeah, you know, that, I, I think that 25 to 30 number would be ideal. I never hit that number. Um, um, I usually should, but um, hopefully I will get to this summer. We'll see. Yeah, I, I think that's the big um, – this is so geography dependent. Like there's no yeah. way we could play 650-something rounds of golf up here in the Northeast. Just couldn't. <laughs> like right. wouldn't, wouldn't be doable. Um, but, you know, if, if you lived in a in a climate where – you know, you could play year round. Um, I would say it's probably close to a hundred. You know, I'd like to think that I could get, you know, two, yeah, two sure. postable rounds yeah. a week um, with a couple bonus weeks in there where maybe there's a third or a fourth. Um, and a hundred should be relatively easy to get to here in the Northeast. Yeah, you know, I, I play a lot of golf. Um, and, you know, I, 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 looking at my own from this past year, I only had like 10 or 11 post like postable rounds postable full rounds of 18 hole golf um the season is just very short even if you are really dedicated and play a lot i play a lot during the week but it's a lot of um nine and nines it's a lot of uh, kind of like piecemeal golf between leagues and and non-league um so it's just a it's it's different i would say northeast if you can get to 25 or 30 postable rounds you're playing a lot of golf yeah, that is a lot of golf. And I think, you know, a lot of times when I think, you know, this is really shaping up to be a postable round and I want to play a postable round today. And then you take a mulligan, right? You're playing with your buddies and you both decide to take mulligans or something like that, right? And I think there's, you know, other factors, you know, you maybe are, don't have it that day, don't feel like posting or something. I don't know. There's a, a couple of different factors that can go into that, right, Josh? So I think that that 30 number, that 25 to 30 number that I mentioned might be a little bit high. I think if I could even get to that 20 number, I'd be very satisfied. Yeah, I no, think it's, it's easy. Talking about you had that eleven number. You you play a ton of golf. You play every single every single week, right? Three to four times a week. So I, I think that's a, a good number to kind of aspire to uh, this coming summer. Yeah, I mean, well, I think you know, I have a little bit of issue with the fact that you know it doesn't seem like nine hole rounds are merged together and counted the same way full eighteen hole rounds are. Um, you know, I, I wonder if the casual. We have a lot of issues with the handicap system as it is. I was going to say, Josh, we can do a whole we can do a whole separate episode about the <laughs> handicap system, right? And the USGA in general, right? Um, <laughs> but like, I just think for the the average person who's picking up golf and playing golf, you know, I think they would they might only have ten or fifteen posted rounds or postable rounds, but they may consider themselves like pretty serious golfers where they are playing three, four, five times a week. So you know, it it's all relative, um, but. 650 or even 350 um, postable rounds of golf that would, even if I lived in a year round golf climate, that would require some commitment that I'm not sure I have. <laughs> Josh, I think it'd be great. A great episode for here on the bounds, a little bit of a special episode to kind of get someone from the USGA or get someone from any sort of handicap system and kind of pick their brain behind what goes on with that, why decisions are made. Right. And maybe even we could talk about this, you know, 652 rounds in a year. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that's something we might uh, we might have to explore. Uh, hey, that is going to do it for this edition of the show. You can catch more over at our Substack. It's out of bounds, golf.substack.com. Subscribe to the show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And follow us on TikTok if you want to see more from us in between episodes. For Nate Sharman, I'm Josh Durso. And remember, whether it's down the middle or out of bounds, keep on swinging. You've been listening to Out of Bounds. If it's coverage, debate, or discussion of pro and local golf, we'll be talking about it. Be sure to visit the website. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. See you next time on Out of Bounds.